the session number two of the 2021 UAE's annual conference. As you know, during this year's conference, we will be talking, we will be debating, we will be working on different aspects of the University 2030 document of the UAE. In my opinion, we will be talking about the main topics we face. As you know, the document uh, was entitled Universities Without Walls, a vision for 2030. And in particular, during this annual conference, we will be focused on some of the key actions needed to realize that vision. During this session of the conference, session number two, our focus will be what we call hybrid campuses. And especially, we will try to answer the question how to make hybrid campuses work after the COVID-19 pandemic. Let me introduce myself. My name is Josep Maria Garrell, and I am the rector of Ramon Llull University in Barcelona. And I am, I am also a member of the UI board. Just at the beginning of the first European massive outbreak of the COVID-19, universities shift to virtual in a very short time. It was just at the beginning, an emergency situation. Sometimes we call it emergency remote learning, emergency remote, whatever you want to say. But during the crisis and depending on the country and the particular situation in the pandemic, our campuses learn how to work in terms of mixing presential activities and online activities. We learn how to combine online synchronous in interaction with much more classical online asynchronous interaction tools. And also, we combine it with a very limited presential activities. We began to talk about hybridization. It is important to formally do a critical analysis of what we have been doing up to now. What are the lessons we are learning? What are the mistakes we are doing? What will remain after this situation? And above all, how all this will help to shape our universities, our campuses, our way to deliver our missions during the next decade. And for talking about that, we have a great combination of speakers for today's session that mix several visions, several points of view, sometimes complementary points of view. I am really pleased to introduce Jakub Grodeki, Vice President of the European Student Union, Rika Tof Norgard, Associate Professor in Educational Design and Technology at the Danish School of Education, Aarhus University in Denmark, and Gorgi Dimitrov, Acting Head of the Unit of Digital Education at the European Commission. Jakub is focused on the quality of higher education, learning and teaching, and also digitalization of higher education. He is also a member of the Advisory Council of Youth in the Council of Europe. Before joining the European Student Union, he worked as a quality assurance expert of the Polish Accreditation Committee. He has an academic background of mechanical engineering and management and production engineering in the University of Science and Technology in Krakow. Rika academic research is focused on the complexities and interrelationships of technology, hybridity, education, design and philosophy in relation to future education. She's leading several research projects about hybrid higher education, digital humanities, and design for future higher education with a focus on formats, challenges, and potentials for the future university. She's also a member of the steering group of the Center for Higher Education Futures and board member of the Philosophy and Theory of Higher Education Society. And finally, Georgi is responsible for the newly created unit of digital education of the European Commission in the Directorate General for Education and Culture. He joined the European Commission in 2008 and was first involved in various roles in setting up the European Institute of, of Innovation and Technology. He led the development of the first digital education action plan in January 2018 and also of the new Digital Education Action Plan that was adopted in September 2020. Before joining the Commission, Georgi worked for several companies in the field of software and telecom. So, as you can see, a very, very interesting combination of speakers today. Let me just remind to all the speakers that you will have nine minutes for making your presentation. 
after the nine minutes time as an, an, as an indication that you are running out of time and you should finish your presentation as soon as possible, I will turn on my camera. Okay, thank you. <laughs> With no more delay, our first speaker will be Jakub. Jakub, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can see the presentation, if I can expect some nodding. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jakub Grodecki, and thank you for the invitation. I have an honor to hold the position of Vice President of ESU, representing 20 million students across Europe. Uh, our members, the National Students' Union from 40 countries uh, in European higher education area, are reflecting the diversity of the student body across our continent. And we acknowledge the fact that every learner in every country might have different needs and ambitions during their education pathways. Pandemic shown the great dose of solidarity across students, but also in constantly highlighted the division in various aspects, whether it's economical one, digital readiness, or simply among various disciplines being studied. Before going into the student's perspective uh, on the topic of our session, which might be naturally expected, I think it is important to bring here and remind a few numbers which were signaling the need for rethinking and enhancing education way before the, before the pandemic have arrived. As you can see, uh, the numbers basically are growing and uh, were growing from the years, and here you you can see the UNESCO trends, mega trends from 2015 until 2013. We see the numbers of uh, basically population in the world, but also higher education enrollments and international uh, students uh, enrolls. So those mega trends are challenging for all of us and comes parallel to growing demand for education provision to achieve more just societies around the world and some general future challenges which the higher, higher education sector will be facing from the youth perspective might be addressed here as well. Um, namely, namely, youth generation is increasingly more aware of social and environmental mission of education. Uh, the need for including the education on sustainability and impact of digitalization have to be embedded in every curricula. The raising inequalities in access to education was, have been also seen, but also the pursuing um, learning and being ready for that were also visible. Currently, one of the challenges that has been put to the education system is an aspiration to implement flexible and dynamic curricula that recognize the differences between individual students to provide the tools for all students to realize their full potential. And last but not least, it is a great mission of education systems to preserve the democratic values and allow youth to learn on how to be active citizen in our societies. That's uh, what we learn at our campuses and that's what bring, uh, the higher education brings to development of youth people is one of the highest value for learners and society. Uh, at large. Going back more to the dispute on uh, hybrid concept of higher education campuses, uh, another motivator for speeding up the education rethinking process have appeared, uh, the pandemic. So uh, we thank for that motivator, unfortunately it arrived, but it's worth to acknowledge here that it was a great test of solidarity for everyone. And we had a chance to see hundreds of examples on how different stakeholders, among which students, were contributing to the crisis management, information flow, and gluing the academic community. The lessons learned during the pandemic can really well lay ground for and allow to better anticipate challenges of developing hybrid models education. But it's worth to mention here that the emergency mode appeared uh, there unexpected and cannot be easily uh, and directly translated as fundamentals for building the future of higher education. I will show you now some of the outcomes of the survey that was conducted by European Students' Union in cooperation with University of Zadar and Institute for the Development of Education in Croatia. And some numbers here well, are showing the very generic issues, but highly connected with on what partially the hybrid uh, concept um, for higher education institutions might deal with in the future. Those are showcasing that the reality from the pandemic learning experience that has been dealt upon before going further. For example, we have the examples and percentages of allowance uh, of, of, of students being able to uh, use the desks, the internet provision, uh, the computers, the good, uh, the quiet place to study. When it comes, for example, to the workload, it has been told by nearly 17,000 responders that the workload has been increased uh, by 50% comparing to the uh, comparing to the times before the pandemic. When it comes to learners' employment, we had a job loss that stated for 12.2% on, um, on, the, on the daily work and 28.9% on the, on the work. Um, I I've see I've seen them talking quite, uh, quite uh, too fast. I'll try to slow down uh, a bit uh, to make it uh, hearable. 
Uh, also, when it comes to flexibility of the tuition fees, that also varied. Most of the tuition fees, as well as scholarships, uh, fortunately, uh, been, uh, been, uh, been stable. However, the flexibility of tuition fees were the matter of interest for many students, and that flexibility was not uh, quite uh, implemented. When it comes to uh, pandemic impact, sorry, I have a problems with my slide currently now. I, I cannot switch it. Okay. Yeah, we believe that... Oh. I'm sorry. Uh, we believe that key questions have to be asked before going further with post-COVID developments. So does hybrid self work for every purpose? We have diverse education systems, our societies and perception of pursuing education in different countries varies from another. Uh, due to the changing expectations of learners, it will be also crucial to constantly monitor the various motivation to pursue the education. It might be more individual approach, more connection with the local society, and in parallel, the need for in this interdisciplinary education and learning the future skills. We also have to thoroughly research on that cause, the dropouts of the learners, their mental health situation and aspect of isolation in pandemic. But also while learning online, need to tackle this issue along with the possible recap of the missed learning opportunities for current students and support building up learning communities for the first year students uh, that enrolled during the pandemic. Mm, here, I would like to share with you some reflection points from a learner perspective, uh, while should be taken further with developing hybrid campuses. Those might go along in finding the balance between physical and digital presence, synchronous and asynchronous approaches, living in the city of studies or outside of it. Connecting this with employment or pursuing education alone. So we are having their uh, issues connected also with the fair enrollment procedures and commodification of learning opportunities. While designing the hybrid provision in the future, we have to take into consideration the expectations of learners and the ability to pay for it uh, for contributing to the wider society. Material condition of students and learner are also technical uh, requirements and the access of internet. Interoperability between the different learning spaces. For example, currently uh, problems uh, for many, many students were reported that uh, lessons are being held in five, six various platforms. The future probably should be a bit more unified when providing those spaces. The new relation between teachers and learners is also reflected. The institutional support for both teachers and learners have to be uh, have to be uh, provided because of the fast changing reality. We have to um, we have to learn together how to how to use this as opportunity. Um, for the next one. Uh, sorry again. Some problems with slide changing. Uh, I did not see. I have a very big lag in a, in a, in a, in a, yes. So luckily there is an approach that have been widely taken by many countries and higher education institutions. We believe uh, that the student-centered learning uh, can be easily transferable to the hybrid settings. It is great that innovative learning and teaching was pointed out during the survey at the first part of our conference today. Uh, in my opinion, main challenge will be related to achieving the very individual learning path in the future, and maybe with the support of the analysis on the individual learning pace of each student, and at the same time, allowing the learners to gain the skills that can be learned only throughout the human interaction. So combination of those two approaches might be the biggest challenge for the future. Uh, last but not least, it will be crucial to see how the democratic processes in our institutions, in the hybrid campuses might look like, and support the stakeholders' engagement in co-decision making. How to ensure that stakeholders' representation, which mirror the academic community, community will be taken and invited to the dialogue in co-shaping the future of higher education institutions that we know so far. What are the ways uh, to support the students' movement and civil society engagement at large in the hybrid mode. I'm very uh, sorry uh, for uh, being a bit fast. Try to slow down very much, but I'm uh, very aware of the timer, so I'm finishing right now. I would leave this presentation here with those questions uh, that have been put on my presentation, and that would be all from my side. I would like to hand the microphone to Rika to ask on how the notion of hybridity changes the university and how we can develop genuinely hybrid universities to face all of these challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jakob, and hopefully everyone can hear me as well. Um, I can see Jakob, so you can not if you can hear me. Uh, yes, excellent. 
Um, thank you so much. So, uh, Jakob, uh, my name is Rikke Toft Nørgaard, uh, and I'm here in the sun. Uh, and I'm an associate professor in educational design and technology at the School of Education at Aarhus University. And as mentioned, also in the steering group of Center for Higher Education Futures and in the board of uh, the philosoph philosophy and theory of higher education society. All of these focusing on the future purpose and role of higher education institutions and new futures in uh, higher education in and for society. Um, for the last five years, I've been working with colleagues to develop strengthened theory, methods and practice for hybrid higher education, especially in relation to emerging technological fields, formats, futures, as well as their potentials and challenges. And so while Jakob uh, focused on student and learner perspective, I'll try to focus on institutional and development perspectives uh, and theoretical grounding, institutional uh, principles and a development framework. And also while Jakob was talking from the pandemic perspective, looking to the future from the pandemic, I will try to talk from a decidedly post-pandemic perspective, looking to the future from pre-pandemic theory research uh, and practice of higher education institutions and higher education. So in, re in the recent document uh, from the European um, uh, university association with the title universities without walls they lay out the vision for universities in 2030 here future universities and the future of universities are described as universities without walls that are communities with open boundaries characterized by being cooperative uh, and networked institutions and they say that the nature and structure of universities will be hybrid that is uh, as open and physical virtual spaces and that this will entail physical and digital learning and research environments, which are designed in a holistic way. The EUA vision emphasizes that the nature and structure of future universities are hybrid. And if we try to synthesize some of the characterizations in the document, we get a provisional glimpse of what the hybrid university might signify and entail. So it's a university without wall, that is a, a driver for societal change, that is a community, it's cooperative and networked, um, it's holistic and hybrid designed and so forth. But what does it actually mean to be hybrid? How can we get a better grasp of the notion of hybridity and the ways in which it changes both the future university and university futures? Drawing together the last five years of writing within the theory, method and practice of hybrid higher education, uh, the first important distinction that emerges is the distinction between hybrid, hybridization and hybridity. So hybrid refers to new species, forms or cultures uh, that are crossed, crossed or fusions or dissolutions of already existing species, forms or cultures. So a hybrid such as a mule is neither a donkey horse or a horse donkey, but something other, something in itself, a mule. Then uh, hybridization refers or describes to the process of crossbreeding, fusing or dissolving species, forms or cultures to create something new, something other, these new hybrids. And hybridity refers then to, is, a, is then a term for the relation between a hybrid and the source material. So hybridity highlights uh, what makes a hybrid hybrid its otherness, its distinctive uh, signature traits uh, that is composed when comp compared to other species, forms or cultures. This entails that a hybrid university then utilizes hybridization to dissolve dichotomies or create new fusions between existing dimensions such as online and on-site, um, digital or analog, uh, located or distributed, uh, formal or informal, uh, in the world or on the campus and so forth to uh, create and develop uh, new hybrids and hybridity as an institution. The next important distinction is how hybridization is concretely undertaken through fusion dimensions of dissolving dichotomies in order to create new hybrid institutional frameworks, educational formats and or academic practices. Thinking otherwise about these dimensions while working intentionally and reflectively like an alchemist trying to create gold and with the traits of universities without walls in mind 
enable us to envision and design for other futures frameworks and formats for the university and subsequently to create new hybrid beings. Importantly, this undertaking of hybridity also points towards potentially the most important distinction uh, when it comes to hybrid university and hybrid higher education. The distinction between an understanding of hybrid as a technical solution or setup, something that has become particularly prominent during the pandemic, and an understanding of hybridity as a certain kind of institutional and academic being connected to deeper structures of theory, method and practice. So during the pandemic, with its stages of panic, survival and endurance for both institutions and academics, we have, understandably, witnessed a disconnect from theory and research. There was no time to think, develop or connect practice to existing theories, methods and education development within the field of hybrid education. There was only time to act. However, we must now, importantly, reconnect with the field of hybrid theory, research and practice to create deeper structures and understandings of what the notion of hybridity brings with it for universities and higher education. We must, in other words, reorient ourselves to see hybridity as deep institutional and academic being, where hybrid higher education it tries to simultaneously be physical and digital, uh, online and offline, process and product for the individual and for the collective, for the university and for the world, formal and informal, distributed and co-located, and so forth. It's a space of inclusion and fusion rather than exclusion. Hybridity carries with it an intricate and distinctive entanglement of roles, contexts, practices, spaces and materials that position universities and its inhabitants as deeply cooperative, networked and networking, using hybridization to build bridges and create dialogues between different people, societal ecosystems and cultures. So for the last section here to round off, how does hybridization and hybridity concretely change the university? And what kind of development agenda lies before the university to become genuinely hybrid beyond technical solution and foster hybrid higher education? First of all, it requires a move from the ephemeral digital nowhere university and the global everywhere university that are characterized by being universities for really no one or anyone towards university as hybrid communities that are something for someone. Communities that are somewhere in the world and has a particular spirit and signature that makes it into a particular kind of hybrid, a unique being or bastard that stand out in the world and makes its inhabitants identifiable as belonging to that particular somewhere wherever they are in the world. Secondly, it requires a move from the pandemic emergency campus into the formation of post-pandemic hybrid universities, leaving behind the quick fixes and technical solutions, as well as the pandemic mindset of panic survival and endurance. This requires engaging the scholars and specialized experts in the field of hybrid education. We cannot learn much from the pandemic university about how to think, do and be as hybrid post pandemic university or about what good hybrid scholarship of teaching and learning looks like and how to practice it. Thirdly, it requires an opening up of the university to let it become both hybridized and hybridizing to curiously and creatively, intentionally and innovatively work with the fusion of dimensions and dissolution of dichotomies to create new hybrid cooperative and networking universities. Fourthly, and perhaps perplexingly, the notion of hybridity demands a move away from digitalization and into post-digital futures. The dissolution of dichotomies and fusion of dimensions also pertains to the distinction between digital and physical, online and on-site. They are fused into something other and the digital is left behind. It becomes something hybrid. Lastly, and this is the last slide, but not least, all of this establishes a hybrid university as a holistic open ecosystem nested within and in dialogue with other ecosystems. So within the ethics of hybridities lies concern, compassion and care for the ways in which hybrid universities influence the hearts, hands, heads and habits of all these inhabitants as well as the surrounding ecosystem. So 
Last sentence, highlighting the ethos of the hybrid university, universities must then make sure that the hybridity of its institutions, frameworks and systems does not take the form of sinister or cold-hearted hybrids, but as kind-hearted hybrids that honors the virtues and purpose of the university and puts human humans head, hands and hearts before technical systems, solutions and setups. So I think my time is up. Thank you so much for giving me the time. And the last couple of slides, uh, you will find the references uh, to this talk that is built upon. But, Georgi, handing the floor over to you, how do you see the vision laid out by the higher education sector aligning with what is being done at a European level to innovate and hybridize university activities? Thank you very much, Rike, and uh, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, many thanks for uh, preparing the ground so well to, um, um, uh, for me. Uh, I will take, of course, the policy perspective and uh, it will be uh, much more short term in terms of uh, reflection, um, but possibly outline some of the aspects that can help us uh, towards the future um, in the next couple of years, which is uh, what I would like to focus on. I would like to structure my nine minutes um, uh, with the help of three questions. Um, and those questions uh, will be about uh, what is the potential of the um, hybrid, uh, what have we seen through the COVID uh, crisis, and what is actually needed um, to make hybrid work. And then I would like to say a little bit about the digital education action plan. Um, first of all, um, I think that um, uh, it's uh, probably quite trivial, but um, I would like to still repeat one of the uh, lessons we have seen through the open public consultation we ran last year on the Digital Education Action Plan, which proved to be one of the most uh, demanded and popular one um, ever. And it was that 90% uh, of uh, the respondents effect, um, um, effectively expect that the COVID-19 crisis will be a turning point for the use of technology in education. And apart from the question whether this will be fully hybrid or fully digital or, or, or um, something in the middle, uh, what is important is uh, to come back also to what um, our uh, chair mentioned uh, very early on. Um, we need to move from the remote urgency to something which I would call a strategic and long-term approach towards digital education, which needs to entail a blend of hybrid. And this is one of the reasons why we have also launched the Digital Education Action Plan, but I would like to come to this in a second. Uh, and the first uh, question is essentially, what is the potential uh, of the hybrid campus? Um, well, on the one side, um, it is very clear that the um, uh, potential of the hybrid campus is that they can help to address unequal access, uh, which is there still. Um, and it is there because of socioeconomic or rural urban divides. And we can also achieve certain economies of scale when it comes to providing learning that is more inclusive and also more flexible. Uh, we know from an EUA report from 2018 that um, the demand for short-term learning opportunities is growing and we need more flexible programs. And indeed, to use technology in education allows to expand this type of learning opportunities. And also it allows to meet the different demands of the demography. And I think we heard some of it already um, um, in the presentations before. On the other side, the impact can be quite huge because um, we have to consider that um, this is yet another data point. 2019 Euro study, uh, student study uh, said that 51% um, of students in Europe work during the whole lecture period. Uh, or from time to time, and 50% of them would not be able to afford to study without a paid job. So this is a very concrete driver to think about the hybrid. And they do promote innovative forms of learning, cooperation and communication. And also um, in the current academic year, for example, uh, for example, many universities are continuing to experiment with um, fully uh, online courses or with some sort of blended, and we expect this to continue. There are a number of challenges here. Um, infrastructure, connectivity and access to devices is one of them. 
Uh, on the other hand, the level of the students and staff competences are also an issue. And very importantly, and uh, Rike also mentioned it uh, to an extent, the question of the uh, effective learning design, the question around uh, quality content, but also innovative assessment methods are still huge challenges. Looking back, there are a few uh, lessons. Uh, first of all, we have uh, observed that um, across the education sectors, higher education is more prepared than, say, schools. Um, nevertheless, we have seen huge gaps when it comes to the questions around learning design and digital capacity. And um, we have also seen that uh, sometimes um, analog forms have been basically moved to the digital space and um, uh, the instructional design methods that uh, would have been necessary perhaps have not been used for lack of time or other reasons. In any case, this is something that we have seen. Um, an important part is that uh, the question of um, uh, well-being and mental health has become huge and needs to be taken into account when we think about these future hybrid forms. And um, going forward, um, there should be a more general level of professionalization, if I can put it like that. And this uh, means a lot of investment into skills and competences around building the, the learning uh, rather than just, let's say, transmitting it. And the third question that I would like to ask here uh, is what is needed in order to make this type of um, uh, hybrid uh, campuses effective. Uh, now, this is not a question that we are uh, going to completely answer in the action plan, but I would like to uh, say that we are uh, proposing some uh, priorities there which will help us to get there gradually and over time. And uh, let me mention just that the Digital Education Action Plan was adopted in September last year. Um, it has a two, um, um, two uh, sort of strategic approaches. One is the development of high-performing digital education ecosystem, and the other is the development of digital skills and competences. We like to think of those as the two sides of the same coin. And uh, we have proposed this action plan with a longer duration and with an extended scope to cover also uh, lifelong learning. With this slide, I would like to uh, make a couple of points um, under each of the priority areas which we believe can contribute to the build of the effective hybrid um, campus. On the one side, uh, we need to have digital capacity planning and development which are part of the process. Um, there should be the ability to deliver hybrid modes of learning and teaching, so the um, capacity must be there. And this also in view of the unequal access. Um, secondly, when it comes to internet connectivity, we need to rely on very um, uh, heavy uh, bandwidth uh, applications. And uh, we have video streaming all the time, so we are talking about um, gigabit and be beyond. And we need to ensure this in order to uh, avoid the, the glitches and so on, because um, that's actually quite an important aspect of the overall provision. And of course, we need uh, proper devices. The training of the uh, staff in digital skills and pedagogy is absolutely essential and educators will need to be empowered to adopt innovative methods. And um, of course, these type of competences should be um, developed in a sustainable manner, starting from initial teacher training and going through CPD, uh, continuous professional development. And of course, high quality digital education content I already mentioned is a very important key requirement and needs to be reflecting instructional design methods that are appropriate for the uh, technologies of today uh, that support learner-centered design and which are also supporting the autonomy in the learner which is required. On the other hand, we need enhance, to enhance digital skills and competences. And we have to have students, of course, who are digitally skilled and confident. And in 2019, a fifth of the young persons in Europe reported to not have basic digital skills. So this is, uh, this is an issue still. Um, and also we need to think about advanced digital skills uh, when it comes to um, specific disciplines. 
My last point um, is an overview of the actions which we have put forward in the Digital Education Action Plan, which are addressing higher education in particular. So what you see here with the hats uh, are the actions that are um, addressing the higher education sector. And I would like to give you just two examples and I would finish. Um, first of all, uh, we are proposing under the new Erasmus um, program, which, by the way, um, was launched just a couple of weeks ago, and the call is available, so you can um, already see it. We are proposing what we call digital transformation plans for higher education institutions and actually other institutions as well. So we are going to support the development of such transformation plans, uh, digital pedagogy and expertise in a holistic way. So the Erasmus Key Action 2, the cooperation projects, will support this. And I invite you to look at this. And the second example that I would like to give here is uh, on the site of uh, a European digital education content. This is a um, very important issue in the longer term. We do not always have um, high quality education content available also online or for other digital purposes. And we believe that we need to put more effort there to reflect our cultural diversity, our uh, linguistic diversity, but also to much Im more improve uh, uh, the issues around uh, instructional design, accessibility, and uh, also recognition. These are two examples from funding on the one side with Erasmus and then policy with the uh, content framework on the other side. And there are a couple of others that um, you can find if you look into the action plan. Allow me to close this by saying that um, we believe that uh, digital education has a great potential to uh, improve the um, uh, hybrid campus. There is a lot of challenges, however, that we need to still fix before we get there. Uh, many of them sound trivial, but are not easy to address. And we must start there. Um, in order to be able to have a common uh, level playing field. And we have to be able to plan because all of this um, is difficult. It takes time. It takes a lot of investment, a lot of patience. Uh, and one of the contributions that the Commission is doing is uh, the support measures that I have uh, just outlined. Many thanks. And I would like to give the floor back to our chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to our three speakers and also thank you for perfectly adjusting to your, to your time. I think that uh, your messages are crystal clear and we have lots of topics to, to debate on. Um, I would like to invite the audience to ask questions to the speaker using the Q&A tool of our platform that you can find under the question mark icon on the left of, the, of your screens. I also would like to invite our three speakers to interact with reactions and questions to your presentation. You can do it just by turning on your mic, okay? And then I will place just one initial question uh, for both, Jakub and Rike. I would like to know your opinion, your views on the presented plans by the European Commission. Are they realistic? Are they too ambitious? Are they not ambitious enough? Jakub, Jakub, maybe you can be the first one. Thank you very much uh, for, for reaching me out. I'm uh, really sorry again for the pace of speaking before. It, is, it was during to trying to squeeze all the content possibly. Uh, however, the presentations shall be, shall be uh, available also to you uh, after after the session. Regarding, regarding your question, uh, we really see the digital transition process when it comes to students either learning and teaching or students' involvement in the democratic processes on the universities as a kind of overlapping uh, issue. We are not treating it as a separate, uh, separate topic. So uh, definitely the mm, kind of a space that is being given by the digital education plan in the sense of uh, treating either learning and teaching uh, strategies, either providing the, mm, the, 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 the training on the digital skills, the, the, the support for the teachers and so on on the one side, and then dealing with the structural and need for the investments on the, on the another side is very important to go in parallel because 
uh, students which are currently enrolled do not will not face this reality by now by the end of their enrollment it will be considering the whole uh, study programs in some years when some students will enroll to the university and they will face kind of a changing reality it will not be just a decision just a, just a Im implementation of the program at uh, at once so uh, so indeed more for us important from the student perspective uh, is is to en ensure that the possible future people that will be enrolling to the universities will have the equal chances of doing so and if the strategic priorities of either higher education institutions or the countries uh, or the ministries or the in the wider scale in the international settings uh, have to allow to not limit the certain amount of people to participate in this education. So the, mo the biggest threat that we, we might see and would be would like to avoid in the sense of how students are perceiving now the implementation is to uh, is to not uh, kind of um, provide the double uh, double standards. I will not say double standards, but double speed and double accessibility from those who know how to do it, who have a background and readiness to do it, and for those who might, for example, face issue with uh, with lacking the internet connectivity. So that's a lot uh, to do in the sense of also budgeting this these actions to make our our societies, make our rural areas, for example, interconnected to allow those people to um, to access those hybrid education modes, because ultimately it's for uh, for uh, for those who has a disadvantaged backgrounds to access the education and not to create and uh, and have um, the current realities for those who can do that. So, uh, so, so that would be my comment for for the plan. But indeed, like we 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 acknowledge the priorities and the need for uh, taking care about this issue very much. Thank you, Jakob. Rika. Thank you, Jakob. And I'll just kind of jump off from from your nice reflections here and and perhaps point towards three things. So the first thing uh, is to to think about this not from this pandemic perspective that we that is a certain unless if you're kind of developing emergency readiness um, as Hot just so nicely talked about so if we are doing something beyond emergency and beyond the pandemic we need to really reconnect with these existing practices and fields that has been too rushed so far so seeking out the expertise seeking out the 40-year expertise fields of something like network learning or hybrid education or online distance education and start from there rather than starting from the pandemic so that would be like one point to reconnect to to those nice experiences that are already there the other thing would be to uh, think about how to transform this kind of european not global but european perspective that of course are for everyone but it's also for no one and anyone uh, so how to transform that into something for someone. So what is the particular kind of signature pedagogy or signature design or signature framework that you are developing here? So that would be the second point to, to think about really working with this notion of hybridity, if that's what you're working with. Um, the last point would be to um, make sure to clearly distinguish between uh, something like digital education, online education, blended learning, uh, flipped classroom, uh, parallel teaching, which I think is the notion for hybrid teaching during the pandemic. If I should say something from my research field, like what we call hybrid teaching during the pandemic is indeed parallel teaching and then hybrid frameworks. So, so when we think about the digital, what are we really thinking about and having kind of a clear methodology, clear educational development framework, and a clear vocabulary. So we don't talk about anything and nothing, but like really talk about something in order to do something particular. Uh, and, and one thing would also be to think beyond technical systems and solutions and setups and quick fixes, and think for the longer term about developing deeper, uh, deeper frameworks. Thank you, Jorgi. Maybe you can react. You're on mute. Um, I do appreciate very much the feedback um, that both um, uh, Rick and Jakob provide here. Um, I take it um, um, that um, the long-term aspect is quite important, and indeed, we are we are moving beyond the digital 
but we are still kind of stuck into it very much. And uh, I, that's probably my, my main point here. Um, many thanks for this. I want to go to a question of, of, of Alessandro, who wrote what would be in a, such a uh, uh, plan. And um, I think it's a great question. And uh, I would like to suggest the following. Um, think about Maslow's pyramid. We all know it, no? Imagine what is at the bottom and then the stacking on it. Well, you have to start with infrastructure. You have to start with uh, connectivity. You have to start with devices. You need all of these things. They will be at the bottom. So you would have, you know, you would have the, you would have the, you would have the, the pyramid. And this is a must do. This is something that you would have to address in your plan. But I think you really need to talk about your students. And you would have to understand what is the vision of your institution, because the Academy of Arts in Dusseldorf, Germany, will have completely different needs than the um, University of Josef or um, another, um, let's say, huge university, maybe um, somewhere else. And you would have to create some scenarios. How many of your students are going to be working population? How many of them would be, you know, uh, maybe going to, to, to be in practical art classes? And I think this is the type of thing that should be put in such a um, plan, and it would be always um, dependent on a couple of factors that are must-haves and on some other factors that are completely individual according to the institution and this is the way i would think uh, about uh, these digital transformation plans by the way it's the first time we're launching it so uh, i do not have also the blueprint uh, in all honesty thank you we have several questions from the audience about the, about the topic of mental health Concretely, um, there is a question uh, about uh, how the commission, and I suppose that when, when the audience uh, writes down the commission means the public administration, how the commission uh, is looking to tackle with mental health issues, uh, how can we identify best practices, how can we act from the university sector? I don't know if Georgi and Rika and also from the student point of view, you can say something about that. Rika, you first. Yes, um, I was playing around with the interface. You should never do that. Um, yes, thank you. So, and I think perhaps also that I will try to jump off your perspective, Georgie, that you just delivered, which is which I'm also and then connected because I think there's a Maslow pyramid, which is also about health and uh, well-being and being well, which is something else. Uh, and human flourishing and stuff like that. So I think it's also thinking about those perspectives. So there's different pyramids, I would say. Um, so, and that, that's what I like about the signature pedagogy framework. And I will come to the question about um, health. So there you start with kind of the virtues and values, the pedagogical, the whyness of the universities and the whyness of digital transformation and the whyness of how to even develop a, a infrastructure or technical solutions like why are we doing this and there to kind of reposition that and put the humans first in a certain way when you develop that argument is to not lose sight of them because i think a lot of the times it can be very much about technical setups and uh, numbers and scales and then kind of students ends up being kind of a number in, in a stream going back and forth, like we have a learning management system at Aarhus University, they're not even allowed to have a picture, for example. They're really disconnected. They're not allowed to talk to each other through the LMS and so forth. And so we have a nice infrastructure. Everything is working. We have extreme well Wi-Fi connections, but that doesn't mean that we feel connected actually. So having the putting humans first, having kind of the ethos of hybridity or the ethos of the purpose of the university, and then thinking about how and what in relation to technology and, and digital transformation. I think, I think that's one way to think about how to uh, nurture, foster a, a community, as it was in the universities without walls, a care and a compassion for each other, that the, uh, technology should connect us, not disconnect us. Technology should connect us with the world 
make us network with each other, network with the world. And how do we then do that? What would be a format where we can actually do that, that has a pedagogical intent uh, and, a, and a design care? I think, I think that's, that's one way of almost, I don't know, Georgie, putting, turning the pyramid upside down. Thank you. Jakub, I don't know if you have any feeling from the topic of mental health among students uh, during this period. Yeah, I think uh, I think I can start uh, with that that we have been facing. Uh, it, it, it's a bit related with the Maslow pyramid in the sense of uh, also in which environment students are uh, looking at this topic as a very very first priority and so on. Because we faced, for example, very uh, effective and successful campaigns in, a, in 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 some countries that are enlightening this 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 need very much. Uh, so, for example, for the first time, universities started to establishing. Uh, very uh, like a huge number of uh, universities established the, the mental health support uh, contacts in their universities. That was a good start in some countries. Whether in others it's already been there, but for example, the next topic could be how to uh, how to deal uh, with indeed this sense of uh, of lacking of support in the digital reality. I was I was talking about this um, about this survey on my uh, on my presentation shortly, and if if you would uh, be interested in looking at the survey uh, more, it's it's available on the. Um, on the EHEA webpage, on the on the Bologna webpage, basically, uh, you you would see in there how many, for example, per percentage students would require the mental health uh, support. Uh, it was more than a ten percent. First of all, there are also interesting data. Who would who was the first? Um, target of uh, to reach for help mostly uh, mostly people were reaching to the very inner circle of of friends or uh, family members whether they did not have the chance to uh, reach uh, reach to the professional so both mainstreaming the, mm, the 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 existing problem in the discourse is very important on the universities in different settings and then uh, also using this knowledge to implement the real action and that those actions has to be supported indeed and in the major scale definitely we can we we, we are going through a more acknowledging of of a social dimension aspect of higher education through the communique of, of for example of bologna uh, process that is addressing those issues um, uh, directly also uh, from uh, from from our input in the in the in the previous bologna term so uh, let's hope also for implementation in these regards uh, to be taken thank you jacob georgi you're the last one um from my point of view uh, the um type of mental health issues that have emerged uh, last year um are not necessarily something that can be directly addressed by the universities only and i don't think that um there should be, um, let's say, yet another layer of um, administration created in order to address these type of things with, uh, with all respect for, for the problem. I think that the problem is temporary and it will retreat. Um, the question is uh, how much from uh, what is uh, happening in the distance of the online, which is very, very different way of, of, of teaching and learning, uh, what um, what is going to be there in future that can perhaps bring people a bit more together rather than close, uh, let's say, uh, close them from each other. And uh, um, in this field, the European Commission is not necessarily very active because um, um, we are, uh, of course, supporting uh, different type of projects. And we have some projects, of course, now that the mental health is uh, an issue. but we would not uh, claim that we have uh, any guidelines here or anything that we would propose to be a solution. Um, what I would just say is that um, the social and emotional uh, connection between people is uh, the most important aspect. And what we have seen is that maybe um, we, um, we did not always know also who our students are, uh, since uh, sometimes we, we sort of lost connection with them. Uh, as it happened last year, but um, more than that, I would not, you know, uh, venture on the side of the Commission, at least. Okay, thank you. We have another set of questions from our audience about uh, the investment needed to transform the, the university sector in general. Uh, I would also like to add to this question, um, may I ask you to reflect on the necessity of collaboration among public administration? 
and I will suggest to, to try to answer the question from the administration point of view, also from the, let's say, we can theoretical research point of view, and also from the students' point of view. Um, Jakub, why don't you are the first? Investment for transformation. What do you think it's most more trying important? to unmute and mute myself all the oh, time? Okay. I was actually responding on the live answer to one of the question. Oh, uh, so uh, so indeed, when it comes to investment, I think the big role uh, plays here the recovery and resilience funds on the major scale. Like how we how do we uh, address these transitions on the on the on the European wide uh, wide scale? When it comes to uh, like we are now uh, launching the campaign as as to, uh, that we're trying to um, address this issue that minimum. 10 percent of of the of the funds should go indeed to uh, to the investments in education in both of the transitions uh, so definitely the, the the funds has to be uh, used in in, the, in in enhancing the topics that are on the table and not necessarily just to uh, be steered into kind of supporting the existence of 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 the current uh, current current situation because that does not necessarily address the the problems all the time so we would uh, we would uh, we would like to see also the consultations for example on the national level on how uh, those uh, those funds can be taken and re when it comes to the university itself i think it lies very much uh, on the on the, on on kind of supporting the discourse and getting into the table all of stakeholders possible on the on the university on higher education institutions level uh, because therefore the spending it's very much related to um, to what are the needs of the stakeholders locally so uh, that's why i was addressing it a bit shortly also in the presentation that in the digital reality we have to be even more cautious about how we want to preserve the involvement of the stakeholders because we might be losing the link as a as a as a between the stakeholders on the university maybe on the between students and ministries the stakeholders ministry as i'm sorry for being student centered it's basically all all, all of you here in my head so I'm being uh, very student filtered in, in some of the answers, but that applies to the, all of the stakeholders that can be simply a bit distanced in the digital reality right now. So that's important to immediately after, after the reco recovery, after the pandemic will end, to get on the table uh, and ensure the meaningfulness of this involvement uh, between various stakeholders. Thank you, Jakob. Rika? Yes, so this will probably be from a more theoretical perspective, um, but building on, on the work of, of uh, Ron Barnett, who's a philosopher of the university, I would point towards the concept of, of the ecological university. So that's a university that that are, are nested within society and has society nested within it. So rather than having thinking about cooperation as something where the university kind of leap for society or leap for stakeholders, um, then actually going into a deeper conversation with these. Uh, there's this nice concept of quadruple helix uh, used for libraries and elsewhere, where you have like these ecosystem working, working together in a authentic way, in a deeper way to gain a certain kind of ambition. And I think it's really about enhancing the topics as Jakob said, and it's also about creating new hybrids that fit within the purpose, the ambition, the institutional framework that you're working within to create this kind of depth and create new kind of collaborations that are um, less technical and more um, foundational uh, to, to seek out new ways rather than doing what you always always have done. So trying something new, but but not just for the sake of newness or technology or let's do everything with VR, let's now use robots as teachers or I don't know, whatever the the, the fad of, of the year is, but, but really thinking about these kind of deeper collaboration and this idea of the ecological uh, university that Ron Barnett wrote an excellent book on. Thank you, Rika. Jorge, one minute answer. Um, Two examples. First of all, uh, because universities are very autonomous, unlike schools, uh, uh, they can do quite much more. So, for example, they can share much more resources and um, the a key resource of the future will be digital infrastructure. So there is no need for everyone to build their own thing. A lot can be shared. That's first. Second, recovery and resilience funds. Um, 
the investment which goes there must come with a reform. And for this, uh, the reform is unlikely to come top down, but the, the resilience plans are coming from the member states. So the universities have to get very active through EUA, through their associations and to lobby the governments in order to get uh, some sort of um, also bottom up uh, ideas because otherwise it, um, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Georgi. I'm afraid our time is up. I would like to thank our speakers for sharing your points of view. And also I would like to thank the audience for the participation. Uh, there are lots of answers that, that are on the chat and we, are, we, we don't have time to, to answer all of this. As I said at the beginning of the session, it is important to formally do a critical analysis of what we have been doing up to now and during this emergency pandemic situation and try to figure out uh, what are the lessons that uh, will help to shape our universities, to shape our campuses, our way to deliver our mission during the next decade? I think that our speakers help us to reflect uh, on it. I should invite all of you to, to go outside the session, to come outside to the virtual lobby for a minute or two, where the masters of ceremony will provide further guidance of what's ahead in the conference. You can do it just by clicking leaf in the top right corner of your screen and you will exit this room and you will go to, to the lobby. So thanks a lot once again. Bye-bye.